Sitting really in a very uh, special place here, a special situation. What does it make you feel when you come here as a Palestinian? Sad, mostly, that you know the plight of these people, the way they have to use a back road to get to their house, um, the way we just kind of keep taking more and more and more oppression. The noose simply gets tighter and tighter without any perceived end on the horizon. How did you feel when you heard about this project? I was excited for the re for several reasons. Um, the first is that I, I like the idea of many writers from around the world coming together on this. Uh, as Palestinians, we've been telling our story for a very long time. Uh, we write it, we speak it. We, you know, with the advent of social media, I always uh, believed that this was, you know, a big thing for us Palestinians because it meant that we could relay our message to the world uh, in a faster way, in a more effective way. But it was, you know, up until let's say two decades ago or so, I, you know, most of it was still the Palestinian story. The fact that there were international writers coming who had a good readership in their countries. And the fact that, you know, in the end they would all say more or less the same thing would be an immense validation for what was going on in Palestine. Fifty years of occupation is a very long occupation. In my essay in the book I say that uh, the Palestinians are actually doing Israel a colossal favor by calling this an occupation because the definition of an occupation is a temporary state of affairs. Now, half a century later, and more than half a million Jewish settlers and hundreds of settlements that we have, I mean, it's, it's by far exceeded an occupation. It's become a permanent uh, state of affairs. So, in a way, the importance of this book is, is even greater, in my opinion, you know, to really sort of uh, illustrate to the world what exactly we talk about when we say occupation, especially as this not being the case now in, in most of the world, people have a hard time understanding what it is exactly we're talking about. Uh, the fact that these writers wrote uh, personal, everyday stories about their interactions with the people and the places makes it that much more immediate to the reader. Uh, so for these two reasons, I think the book is going to be a valuable one and I hope it's going to have a good readership. Mm -hmm. I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel, which means I hold the Israeli ID uh, and the passport, of course. And I uh, originally was born in Lebanon. My father was exiled in uh, 1970 due to his political work. His name is Sabri Jiris. He wrote a book called uh, The Arabs in Israel, which was the first book to come out about the Palestinians who remained in Israel after the Nakba. He was the founder of the first resistance movement in Palestine and so on. He was exiled to Lebanon. I was born there. And then we, uh, after the 1983, uh, the 1982 Israeli invasion, in 83, uh, I lost my mother due to an explosion in the uh, Palestine Research Center where she and my father worked. And a few months later, we moved to Cyprus together with what remained of the Palestinian cultural institutions in Lebanon at the time. Uh, I lived in Cyprus until the signing of the Oslo Accords, and a year after they were signed, we came back. I came back expecting that I was coming back to Palestine. I had these, shall we say, romantic notions of coming back to my homeland, the dream that every Palestinian has in being exiled all over the world and wanting to come back home. And when I came back, I very quickly began to have the realization that essentially I was coming back to Israel, to a, a state full of animosity and hatred towards its Arab citizens, and a state in which I would never be treated with equality. I stuck it out for eight years because I did want to integrate in my own village, in my own society, but eventually the, the pressure of working in Israel, uh, the pressure, you know, we had the second intifada at the time as well, a few years later, and the pressure of all this and of having to constantly nullify my emotions or, or just repress them while I tried to cope with this very alien, very hostile state around me, it drove me away. Um, I went to Canada for a few years and then I came back to Ramallah because I missed home uh, very much. I thought of Ramallah as a solution to be in Palestine, close enough to my family but not have to live in Israel. But in Ramallah, it's, you know, after the initial rosy picture wears off of, you know, our flag and our, you know, hearing Arabic everywhere and not having to deal with the Israeli establishment, you find out actually that you are the other side of the coin, which is the occupation. 
um, and it's visible in the checkpoints around you. It's visible in people's suffering uh, that you see around you every day. Your friends can't come with you to visit the places you do. And it's, you know, the repression of people's livelihoods that are being kept hostage. And so ultimately you find that, as I said in my book, in their book, on whatever side of the green line we live, we pay the price every day for not being Jewish. Two marked examples that I can think of are um, my friends and my colleagues. Every time they want to travel, they cannot do so through an airport. Like any normal country, like any normal people, they have to traverse the bridge from Palestine to get to uh, Jordan. They have to pay, of course, the fee to get inside Jordan. Then they have to proceed to Amman airport and fly from there. Now, the ludicrousness of this situation, given that the airport is half an hour away, it in itself makes you think about this whole insanity of the situation. The Palestinians were given supposedly autonomous self-rule, but it was never autonomous and it was never a self-rule. If it was a self-rule, we would have an airport, for example. Another example is um, because we are severely curtailed uh, inside the West Bank from industry, from being able to import and export, we rely heavily on Israel. We are the largest export market for Israel. So it's holding us hostage and it's pouring its products on us. Um, opening any business uh, in, inside the West Bank has a host of challenges because you are uh, you know, crippled from free movement, from free trade as you want to. The other big one is health. Um, Millions of people need proper health care. The Palestinian Authority is not in a situation financially or logistically to provide it, again, in large part due to these restrictions upon us. And a friend of mine, last year her father had a heart attack. She needed to get him to more medical care than was available here. They ended up waiting in an ambulance at Columbia checkpoint for four hours. You're talking about a person who needed a multiple bypass. So these kinds of situations, you know, and the soldiers were just saying we haven't had the, the uh, you know, the, the signal yet from the office to let him through. So this kind of, you know, inhuman treatment that you see perpetrated on a daily basis, this is what occupation really means. They are holding four million people hostage in pretty much every aspect of their lives. One of the problems we were worried about with the book was uh, normalization or to be accused of normalization with the occupation and so on. In my work personally, I don't take much account of this. Uh, to me, I don't see that a solution will come forth by us working in isolation and ignoring the Israelis who are the, the other party to this conflict or let's say the perpetrating party to this conflict. Um, we haven't had uh, negative reactions to the book per se, which makes me very happy that people are looking you know, at the content and at the effort rather than just branding it as a normalization or, or any other such, such uh, names. The issue of corruption, yes, it does exist. It exists in Palestinian Authority, in all the Arab countries, and I believe in, in all countries in the world, everywhere, in every institution, large or small. I think the, the larger issue for me is the fact that we should not be recipients of international aid in the first place. We should have our own country and be able to manage our own affairs like any other country. And then corruption will have to be dealt with like in any other you know, normal society. The fact that after all of these years we are still being, you know, re relying on international aid for our economy is a disaster. If this tap stops tomorrow, half of the people here will starve. Uh, and that's a very, very frightening prospect. And also, international aid, you know, as all Palestinians say and as they know, um, it's a double-edged sword because they, it is also, in a way, buying our quiescence, unfortunately. Uh, in many cases, it's preventing people from really expressing themselves, you know, even people who work in organizations and NGOs, they have to watch their terminology. I was in that situation. Uh, where you have to watch your terminology and not say things that are not acceptable and it's very, very frustrating to Palestinians. Yes, I mean, I'm... <laughs> Locally, I have very little hope. Looking at our situation inside Israel, Palestine, it's, it gets more enmeshed and more bitter every day and more complex and, you know, we have the right-wing governments, successive right-wing governments in Israel, it just gets more and more insane. Um, in the Palestinian side, we have more and more fragmentation, and we are really flailing. We, you know, as a, as a people, uh, as a nation, we, we we really have, you know, don't really don't seem to find our way properly forward in a united way, in a way to, to really figure out our next political steps. 
Um, but this book personally has given me hope in the sense that uh, more and more of our plight is becoming known to the international community and I think that's very important because in our case the international community deals a lot of the cards that directly affect us in its relations with Israel and the aid it gives Israel and the aid we, we receive in its you know diplomatic interventions and so on to try and solve this crisis. So for us it's, it's extremely important for our message to consistently reach the world. The other thing is that for me, I was very hopeful because I have met recently a lot of Jewish uh, people and a lot of uh, Israelis who understand the truth and who know what's going on and who are working with us to try and bring an end to this injustice. And this is huge because I'm, I firmly believe that ultimately the solution will have to come from here, from inside, and that no external party will ever really be able to, you know, to, to let's say, to... Uh, force it on its own. I think in the end it's going to have to be a combination of the international community pressure and pressure from inside Israel itself to culminate in some kind of resolution. Inshallah, we hope.